Hello everybody, welcome to Planet FPL, the world where everything revolves around fantasy Premier League. My name is Serge. My name is James. This is our penultimate game week review. One more to go next week. We are nine twelfths of the way through game week 37, James. Or well, you could have just said free, you give your said free answer quarters. In the, so my kids have got a school exam you this said week. Free give your answer in the simplest form. Three quarters of the way through. I hadn't even worked out what the gains were, but yeah. Uh, if I'd have put in nine twelfths, I wouldn't have got a point on my exam, James. Uh, three quarters of the way through. Yes. And uh, all in all, for the majority of people, uh, similar to a few weeks ago, you can kind of ring fence points are very, very mid, it's, mid to late it's 30s not, kind of stuff. In terms of FPL game week, though, it's not three quarters of the way through, really, though, is it? It's, no. it's probably... Standard number of players. It's probably more it. like... 13, 20 seconds or something like that. Most people have probably got nine or so to, to go across tonight and the, the games on Wednesday and Thursday. I can so. say, so I've had 12 play out of 22. Top 10K, I've had just under 11 out of 21. So yeah, halfway. I think it's fair to say halfway. But overall, it's like 10 and a half out of 17, 18. So but then a lot of dead stuff in there. Um, yeah, halfway through the game week. I'm on 36 points at the moment, which is a, a, a big... Green arrow. <laughs> it's gone up. I've it's, gone a big, up. it's a big green, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Really? Hey, I've gone from Fuck 71 you know. to 63, which at that point is it's a fair chunk to go up <laughs> off the back of 36 points. Like, literally, uh, the double United defence of Lindelof and Shaw came in um, nicely. That's nine and six. And uh, I had assists in midfield from McAllister, Mitoma, and Mo Salah. Other than that, my. I, I, Got screwed as most did with City rotation. So, Hall and Grealish Stones, three points between them, including captaincy. No sign of Rashford yet. And uh, Trent, one pointer, still two pointer. So, <coughs> still some games to go. Um, but at the moment, 36 points has given me a green arrow to 63k, which I'm going to take all day long. Whoop, whoop. Yep. Don't suppose I'm catching you because I, I beat you. I've beat you by seven points so far this week. So far, this um, week with forty-three <laughs> points. Wow. Um, who who hauled for you? <laughs> who hauled for me? Yeah. How have you got Bruv, so many points? <laughs> we've got one player different in our starting lineups this week. One player different. Uh, You've got John Stones. I've got Julian Alvarez. Uh, okay, you did. You took the plunge, did you? I didn't make a transfer, and I was debating sacrificing stones for Alvarez to cover me off because I thought he'd play one of the two and his goals to minutes ratio is too good. Like I, I knew Alvarez would return, but I, I would have had to take a hit and I just didn't know if the hit was worth it. Did you, were you able to do that in one move from Watkins? Two or? threes, so I bought Lindelof and Alvarez right. for uh, Watkins and Rico Henry. Lovely. Um, and then when John Stone smashes it in from 30 yards on uh, Wednesday or Thursday, whenever they're playing uh, Brighton, Revenge will be had, I mean, but... What have we come to? John Stones versus Alvarez's heart, <laughs> head to head. I mean, I suppose I, I, I probably would have been odds on to shade that one. But he's interested in that because we spoke about this a couple of weeks ago, the fact that we were on very different strategies. Yeah, yeah. You wildcard in, what, 33 or 34? Yeah, uh, 34. 34. I obviously wildcard in, what, 26. Yeah. And we've still ended up coming to... Yeah, the same point, the same conclusion. Certainly, I, I'm not trying to chase you too far behind. So I was doing making the decisions that was best for my team. Team, of course. Um, what, did, what did you bring in this week? Nothing. I've got two frees now. Oh, so you rolled. I rolled. Yeah, I, I toyed with the idea of doing it um, on Saturday morning. If you sell stones until, and buy Alvarez, we're gonna have the same team. <laughs> until uh, I was, I, I put the deadline streams on, and yours obviously you had to finished bang on because you were going to Tottenham and I flicked over to Andy and then I realised our oh, deadline's passed um, there's no point in me even thinking about this anymore do you miss the deadline? I, I didn't miss it because I'd set my team up do you actually watching the deadline stream and still miss the deadline? well it was background noise I, I, I wasn't desperate to make the transfer if I'm honest with you I just didn't see Stones out for a hit as worth it at all um, with two games I thought it'd no, play no I one. agree I mean to be honest at the start of the week I probably was more likely to buy Stones rather than Alvarez generally because um, I had just about the right money to do it. But the closer it got to deadline, the more I was like, the punt here for Alvarez. Plus as well, Captain Holland. people say, oh my God, Holland didn't start. Um, and it probably is effective of Arsenal losing on Saturday night, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, but I was like, well, Alvarez is the best cover for Holland, even if he didn't yeah, rock up yeah, this yeah, week yeah, and yeah, stuff yeah, anyway. So, yeah. yeah. Um, my take on it was I, I thought 
because there was doubts about KDB, and I didn't think Holland would play twice, even though I captained him. I thought there's a fair chance Alvarez plays twice here, as almost as likely as anyone. So that was the reason why I went for him. Yeah, um, I can understand that. I just wish I'd had the cojones uh, last week to put my money where my mouth was and go Pascal Gross over McAllister. <laughs> um, because he's he's done all right. Goal and assist in the last uh, uh, two game weeks. Good Six points you, and nine. Sage. But I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Sorry about that. Anyhow, Manchester City have won the league three times in a row. Congratulations. Five in six now for yes. them. Yes. Are we in a one-team league now? No. No. If you look at, if you look at the, the last few seasons, um, Liverpool ran them close a um, couple of times. Liverpool won it once. Um, and then Arsenal run them reasonably close again. And Arsenal, you would say, are not like... Their, their, their team is greater than the sum of the parts for Arsenal so they've been able and they've been able to run them close and this is after City have just gone and bought Erling Haaland so no I think um, that if you look at the net spend as much as we moan about their financial dealings they probably spend more than they would be allowed if they weren't cooking the commercial deals and that kind of thing but they don't spend more than Manchester United have or Chelsea have or some of these other teams have. Even your, your club and my club net spends and depends how far you want to go back. So that it's not like they're just buying all the best players. But then, I mean, when you get to buy Erling Haaland for like a 60 million release clause, uh, that's a bit crazy as wage. well. Be, there'll be some sort of silly wages and huge yeah, signing on field. Yeah, that of I'm course. sure there was. But yeah, so I don't think we're in a one-team league though. Uh, I think you can't dismiss how good Pep is. Um, how he's been able to reinvent the team this season when they weren't doing particularly well and struggling. To go on a run that they have, to win that many games consistently in a row is really, really fucking hard. They could hard. end up winning this league by 13 points. It's really, really hard. Uh, it's tiring. Like when we finished fifth and sixth and every week you've got to win again, you've got to win again and you don't and you slip away so quickly. Like it is relentlessly difficult to be up there and they've done it. So... I get it. It's it's they've done well and they they've um, been the best team. They have in the end across in the, the end. whole season. I think um, Arsenal. I can feel a, a mood turning within Arsenal fans, which has probably gone a little bit beyond pride, which I'm sure they still feel and they have every right to feel to, to probably being a bit slapped by the way it's ended with the the Brighton really and the Forest out. defeats. Yeah, yeah. You know, to to be in a position where you were in control and to take nine points from eight games. Yeah, if you're trying to win a league, I mean, realistically, nine points from eight games is it's relegation, relegation form, form, isn't it? Let's yeah. be totally honest. Yeah. Um, so, irrespective of how tough the fixtures were, and Arsenal have had a tough run of fixtures, which includes like a brilliant win at Newcastle, for example. But it was more the the West Ham and Southampton draws. Was there a key point you look back on? You think that was the moment with like a sliding doors moment for Arsenal? So I feel like in hindsight, looking at it now, it's probably the Saka penalty at West Ham, isn't it? Um, he scores that and they win 3-1. I, uh, I think losing to City, like psychologically... But then if they'd, have, what I'm saying, if they'd have beat West Ham, maybe they'd have beat Southampton and then it's different, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, possibly. I mean, that was to, yeah, that was to, to take it to 3-1. I'm trying to think if it was the Liverpool game the week before, maybe, that, that threw away the lead in, that was the original lead domino. Um, but that's Anfield. So a draw they, Anfield they was so, okay. They were so good in that opening half hour. Against us or against Liverpool? No, both. Against Liverpool, well, both. But even against to us, honest, they yeah. bossed us, mate. I yeah. sat there on my own watching that game. I didn't have anyone with me, the kids or nothing. And just mesmerised. They were just keeping the ball, moving it, creating chances for fun. And then, it, yeah, it, it fell I apart. I think that, that's it in terms of those two games specifically. If you watched the first third of those two games, you couldn't have believed that Arsenal mm. wouldn't have won either of them. And what I felt with, with it was like that City do two things really well that Arsenal didn't do. The first was when they're on top, they finish it off. They go two or three up. I mean, Arsenal, to their credit, were two up against us, but City killed the game. I didn't feel like Arsenal killed the game. They still gave away too many chances. And the second thing City do is just they're, they're more patient. And even when it went to 2-2 two, two or what have you, City still, you still feel like they're just going to keep chipping away and eventually we'll win. And, and you know it's coming. And it, it didn't feel that way with Arsenal so much. But, but it did earlier in the season. Yeah, earlier in the season for sure. Um, but as it got towards the end, obviously the, 
the fitness levels and, and the relentlessness of it took its toll on a, on a very young team. I think we keep forgetting, right? Yeah. We, whenever you go on sofa score, um, it always shows the average age of the teams and they're like 27 and a half, 28, 27, 28 is, is what you see in the Premier League. 29, 30 for West Ham sometimes. Is this 24.3 or something on Arsenal? They're kids. Their average age is ridiculous. But they also couldn't dip them kids in and out much, could they? It was the problem. Nah, nah, that was it. They found a problem that I spoke about that, that, that Tottenham had when Tottenham were close-ish for a while was the real difficulty in improving the 11. Mm. It's a challenge Arsenal were going to find. And, and the problem is Arsenal have a very good team now. The squad depth's not quite there. No. But the problem is like if you want to add... So you look at Saliba and Gabriel. Unless you're going to replace Gabriel, if you're buying, you say, "Oh right, you need better cover for Saliba." Yeah, but then you've got to buy the player that knows he's not going to play, play instead of Saliba. Week. It's the it's the old Harry Kane Tottenham problem. Correct. Like, okay, Tottenham need another forward. Yeah, but that forward's not going to play. Yeah, it's very so. Did Arsenal are going to have those challenges with so like probably someone to cover for Saka is a good example, right? And to be fair, Arsenal have been looking at players like Rafinha in the past and that, so we know they wanted to buy in that area. But still, like, how often is Saka not going to play? Anyone coming in is going to know that, unless you're going to move Saka's position. And I think eventually Saka might end up in more of a central role, actually, as, as the years go on. Um, Declan Rice would be an upgrade for Jacker, for 100%. example. That's the one that comes but to mind that's just straight. If you buy him and play him in Xhaka as well, it's an upgrade. Improving on the team will, be, will be a challenge for them. They need to improve the depth because the, the team has actually shown when it's all there together that it's capable of of competing. I think in terms of, is this a one team league now? Like none of us would have had that conversation two months ago. The way it's ended, we have that conversation. We look at it now and go, shit, City have won five out of six. We wouldn't have had that conversation about the Bundesliga recently. Dortmund are one win away from winning the Bundesliga, right? Mm. A couple of years ago, Juventus were winning it every year in Serie A. Now you've had a few different winners, AC Milan, Napoli, etc. And football goes in cycles and particularly the Premier League does. And when Guardiola walks out the door, it is going to be mad difficult for whoever's next. 100%. Because the one thing I think you have to credit the most is, with the, when I reflect on City's season, and I reflect obviously on the two games with Tottenham, the 4-2 when they come back and they beat us, Guardiola had this massive rant after the game about wanting to re-energise the squad, complaining that there were players there who didn't have the motivation and the hunger to yep. win a league again. He bombs out Jao Cancelo. Mm. But then after the window shut, they lost to my team again and they were flat as. That's only three months ago and they didn't look like a team that was going to go on and win the league. Since then, they've won every single game they've played bar one, which was a late equaliser they considered at Nottingham Forest. So he's managed to get them together and it's, it's ironic. It has come since the alleged infringement of FFP rules. As that Since that announcement, they've just gone on a train where I think he's flipped it. He's, he's brought in the old Mourinho trick, isn't it? It's, like it's us against the, the world. world yeah. Where the, the world views City as the villain, but he turns it on his head to make City feel like within their, their group, yeah. they're the heroes and the rest of the world's out there to get them. Plus, City are going to get thrown out this league in a couple of years, right? So don't stress about it. <laughs> <laughs> he's laughing. I'm not joking. Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean... Uh, we we talk a bit more about that on our Patreon pod tomorrow in Money and Football because we're talking about Ivan Tony in that preview alert. But obviously, looking at his punishment versus offences versus what City might get punishment versus offences, yeah, that's probably something we'll learn more about in due course. And let's let's see where we go. We're going to talk about the games. We'll rattle through these, James, and uh, we're down to like last choices and FPL kind of last chance saloon with, with with a lot of stuff. I think a lot of people will be taking punts and stuff this weekend. Yeah, do you know what? Unless, unless unless you're holding on to a lead, be it a mini league or whatever, make make your last transfer enjoyable. Mm. Like I bought Victor Lindelof last week for a double. Like don't buy Victor Lindelof this week. No, no. Like no. make it a fun one this week. Buy an attacking player unless if it's going to be an offensive. You know, if you're going to punt Pedro Porro or something like that, at least it's fun. For example, um, is yeah, it? No, it probably won't be. Okay, it's just. Oh, I didn't know if that's just an, the genuine an attacking fullback segue who, into might, Spurs one Brentford three, but he <laughs> might not even start, for example, as yeah. he didn't on Saturday. Um, by an offensive punt, like punt like Aaron Hickey, who I said to you uh, last week or the week before, will be a name I think we'll be looking at um, next, season. next season. And he did assist, obviously, Brentford's second goal at the weekend. Yeah, so, nice pass as well. Great through ball. You're not going to buy the Brentford defender at home to Man City, though, presumably. Clearly not. Uh, and I don't want to buy a Spurs defender, if I'm honest with you. So no, I'm not going to buy I wouldn't Poro. be advising that. Spurs 1, Brentford 3. 
um, we finally, after what was probably about 25 years, uh, the Harry Kane, why does Harry Kane take free kicks discussion is put to bed because he's finally scored one. And his, first, his first goal for a free kick since 2014. So. Yeah, so when I said 25 <laughs> years, I wasn't taking the piss. That's like nearly nine years. But he, I like, he, that was a good free kick. It was an amazing it was free strike, kick. isn't it? Yeah, it is perfect. Couldn't be better. Um, um, and he hits the ball so well. Very, you guys played all right in the first but, half. Um, did, the, irony, the irony is, yes, actually, we did. Um, although it got flattered a longer the half went on. But we did, the opening 20 minutes, we did play really, really and well. And he mixed actually. up, Bissouma got in there, Dan Juma got a start. Um, I thought you were looking forward can, to can Romero playing alongside Lengley. One thing on the free kick, though, which yeah. is, is, is very similar to Trent's free kick at um, Leicester last week, where Salah's stepped over it, rolled it backwards, Kudazeski has done the same for Kane. Do we think it's legal? I don't know. Why wouldn't it be? Because technically you're rolling a ball. Do you, understand, do you understand what I'm saying? He's putting his foot on the ball and rolling it backwards yeah, rather than it. touching it. But it, is that one contact? Does that count as one contact? Can you? T- is it legal? Uh, I don't know. I don't even know if this is the podcast to be debating. It's Technicalities probably, of rolling not, a ball versus I'm kicking try, a ball. I'm not trying to get Harry Kane's goal <laughs> disallowed. I'm just asking. I don't know. Is it something where they start looking? Because I'm not sure that it's right. Okay, well, let's just start tapping it. You know, the same I, thing, but just I know, but it's it. obviously it's harder to do. You've got a left footer who's going over the wall to to potentially fake that it's going to go over the other side of the wall. So to then tap it, you can't. So that's why they're doing the the step over it and rolling it backwards. It's like a double kid, and then you're shifting it wider the wall. I'm just saying, I'm not saying it isn't. I just think it's a little bit questionable. I'm not complaining. My team scored from yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. It might something. It might be something that gets looked at. Um, not that we want to deny great goals like Kane's and and Trent's being scored in that way. We did genuinely start, quite interestingly. Um, and for the tactical head like me, allow me to say very, very interesting because uh, Ryan Mason, as I'm going to talk about, I'm talking tactics this week. Yep, sorry, advanced tier patrons, here comes another bit of Tottenham for you. Ryan Mason tried to copycat my favourite person, mm. Mr. Roberto De Zerbi. Didn't have the players to do it. But for a while, it was quite interesting. So the, the real main thing, listen, we weren't trying to play out from the back and absorb pressure in midfield. Well, if like you keep Brian playing did. the ball into Ollie Skip. But in terms of positional, it was it was quite close. And what I mean by that is Kulisevsky played through the, centra- through, the, through the middle and he picked four attacking players. And he picked two quick wide forwards in Hyun Ming Sun and Arnat and Dan Juma. And they played very similarly to how Mitoma and Nsiso would have played yesterday for Brighton, where... They stayed at the highest points. Mm. And Kane and Kulisevsky dropped to the ball. And it was quite interesting. And I don't mind uh, Ryan Mason trying something like that in a game like this. Yeah, at this point in the season, go for it. I didn't mind. It was, it, do you know what? It was tactical variation. It didn't always look smooth. And I think the longer the half went on, the, the more Brentford began to work out, okay, this is what's happening here. Um, and they really worked it out. And then by the end of the game, they were yeah. well-deserving winners. But yeah, there was something interesting. The problem is, you've got Sonny there. Who's, Sonny's basically Matoma light now, isn't he, really? Um, yeah. You say you know, that, but then, we, to be honest... A couple of times he broke through, uh, tearing down on goal. Two year, A year ago, even, you don't know if he's, if he's light, right foot or left foot, he's going to hit it and he's going to hit it well. Both times, the shooting was just so tame. You're just like... But then that's Matoma. Matoma's problem is his finishing at the well, moment. Well, he hit the post at the weekend and he had another chance as well. He could have. He, he could have. Uh, he could have. Did he score? I don't know who scored more goals this season. <laughs> Son. Nah. I'd be absolutely certain that Hyun Ming Sun. You reckon? Yep. I'm going to find that I'd out. I'd be absolutely and I'll, certain I'll that Hyun Ming Sun has more his. goals than Karim Matoma. I feel certain that Matoma's got seven and Sun's got about ten. Son has 10 goals and five assists this season. And Mitoma? I'm about to find out. Come but on. Carry on, finish make, talking about it. No, no, no. Yeah. Please make me look good first. <laughs> uh, you're putting me under pressure to click, click, click here. Come on, come on. Where is Karu Mitoma? I already know has the answer. Seven goals, <laughs> nine assists. So 16 attacking returns to Sonny's. We're talking about finishing, Suj. Yes, but also. Mitoma's played one less game. So talk to me on Thursday or Friday, whenever these Mitoma's guys Mitoma's going to get hatched against City, <laughs> exactly. is he? Would, yeah, okay. would it surprise you? Uh, that game could be 0-0, 6 You or said Mitoma versus Rico Lewis is one to keep an eye on. Yeah, but Rico Lewis played yesterday, so I think that's off the table. <laughs> <laughs> and to be fair, I didn't think Mitoma would start yesterday. Um, what I would say on the Tottenham is he's tried... Uh, in the last three games, there have been three variations. 
And obviously, since the Liverpool game, they've had weeks long to work with things. And they're clearly not working with them very well, but they've done different things. So we saw this hybrid a system against Crystal Palace. Then against Villa, it was a little bit more of a, a flat of three. And then this was very, very... This was 100% a back four, basically 4-2-4 four, four from Tottenham. Um, Bissouma was really good in the first half, um, but then I think tired, and it probably didn't help that Tottenham couldn't take him off the pitch. because he was, it was, He's only played, what, 20 minutes, half hour of football since uh, I think December or January or something. But he started the game really well. As he tired, so did Tottenham. What I would say is Tottenham players will be of interest to people this week. We talk about fun punts, right? Sonny does fall into that line if he's affordable for you, right? Someone who could just go off for the one game, particularly if, obviously, it's a game that Leeds know that they have to win. Think of the ball over the top on the counter, right? So Sonny is the sort of player that could certainly have some joy. What I have to be honest about you and say, the read in terms of how Tottenham will play and personnel was quite difficult. So to start saying, oh, Dan Juma started, he possibly came off with an injury. But the idea of like punting a Dan Juma or a Kulazewski or a Richarlison, like I, I don't know how Mason will set this up. Similar replies to Pedro Porro and Perisic. He might go a back three and they might both come back in the team. You can't buy them unless you've got the information. And I think people will want to look at Tottenham thinking, oh shit, they could do leads on the counter-attack. And, and that is true. We absolutely could. Um, but let's not overlook how well Brentford played. One of the things I was saying in the week, Serge, was when they play strong opposition, they always change to a back five. Mm. And I wasn't sure what the read of this was because Tottenham aren't a strong team at the moment. And I thought that they might go back four with the pressure off. And that's what they did. And they were really good. So, so the, the more the, the game half. went on, yeah, the more the game went on. To be fair, even in the first half, they had some moments, but the final pass or the final shot let them down. Like, the longer the first half was going on, you could feel Brentford building a momentum back into the game where it would be a bad shot or a bad final pass, but they were, they were beginning to understand what was happening in the game and working towards it. And Bumo, subject to price, is going to be very, very popular game with one next season. Yeah. Because yeah, of just Tony Bannon now. now. City, yeah. um, and he took both his goals and we've, so well. We've also got reflect on this game, um, the Liverpool game in January, a couple of big games where we've seen Brentford without Tony and he's really stepped up. And he certainly stepped up with his two goals at the weekend, which are terrible from my team's perspective, but very good from his perspective. If he comes in at the price that he's now, what is he now? Five, eight, five and a half, nine? six. I'd say six million is interesting, subject to fixtures and all that. But he's going to be interesting anyway because they can't put him in at seven. Yeah, yeah. There's no justification for yeah, it. Yeah, right. So at six or six and a half, or even imagine if he was five and a half, He's going to be interesting. The only thing I would say is as well, though, realistically, where he's played the majority of this season, might might be a midfielder. Is the only thing to add to that. Yeah, well. I mean, he's like a wide forward, like a Salah and that, and they're all midfielders, so I could see that as a change. But if you well. look at this as well, they've stayed with the back four. Visser was the central forward. Striker. And Bumo played to the right. Uh, Kevin Sade, who is ridiculously rapid, as you warned me the first time you saw him, mm. but is kind of a bit all fart, no poo at the moment, in my opinion, in terms of end product. But there's a player in there, certainly. Um, and Bumo could well be a midfielder, I think. But then imagine, think back to the conversations we had about, say, people like Neto in pre-season, right? Felt like a lot of people went with Neto. He was, what, five and a half? Mm. If Mbumo's in at that five and a half, six million bracket as a midfielder... It's not bad. It's going to be very interesting. Yeah. And I feel like he's the sort of one who... I mean, listen, we don't know what Brentford are going to do in the transfer market. It's worth saying as well. Um, and they, I'm sure they will look for a Tony replacement of some sort. Um, but I think he'd be very interesting. I can already see people talking about it online and stuff. Oh, I'm Bumo. Fed. But I think people are assuming he'll be like third forward slot. I think he might be a midfielder. Mm. Bournemouth nil, Manchester United one. I think we've both predicted one or two nil. Clean sheet and a win for Manchester a few correct United. scores this weekend, which yeah, is unusual yeah. for me. Very. Um, ended up being 1-0. I mean, from the stats and the highlights, United had had dominance, but uh, Slanky had a couple of chances and stuff. But they had 20 shots in the end, Manchester United, without Marcus Rashford in the team. Um, but only 1-0. I mean, the Marcus Rashford stuff on Friday night, people trying to work out investigative whether he got off the coach whether he wasn't what he'd been wearing on his tracksuit and previous away games and stuff and 
yeah, just let the noise go. My take on it was, in terms of keeping him, starting him, was I, I, I can't see where he, he does. He's not back for fa- if he's just ill now, and we know he went, he, he rejoined training on Wednesday. If he's just ill, my take was he probably plays Chelsea on Thursday. Yeah, yeah. Say a couple of paracetamol, Marcus. You'll be all right, mate. If he just had the single game week of Chelsea at home, would I be playing him or benching him? I'd be playing him, wouldn't I? Mm. So that was my take on it, and I didn't want to be in a position where I took a hit to get Bruno Fernandez in. That's arguably what I would have ended up doing. Um, forcing Rashford out when he'd still potentially have to sing. It just didn't make sense for me, I didn't think. So I, I just left him in. Um, United went with um, unchanged team. I think it was unchanged. Um, we shouldn't be surprised about the selection. I mean, it'd probably be similar selection to get the job finished on Thursday night against Chelsea and then yep. they may well would rotate for the Fulham game, which is what we suggested. I, I don't... I know like the likes of Fernandez played every game and Fernandez may well play Fulham, but I I think over the next two games, as long as United get a positive result against Chelsea and clinch that top four, I think you're liable to see rotation at the weekend. Yeah, look, not vintage from United by any means, but it didn't need to be at this stage. Is it seventeen clean sheets have had this season? Yeah, it's incredible. I just need one more. And you did punt up Luke Shaw as a potential captaincy shout, a nine pointer, max bonus on a. But then there was rumours so about good. him as well, and oh, it, rumor, that, yeah. that killed that idea. But yeah, I had someone, I apologise, I forget who it was, someone else asked me on my deadline stream about the idea of someone to talk me out of Captain Shaw, and I, I won't. I said, I don't think it makes sense because there's a small speculation that he might not even be there. But yeah, I, I really fancied United mm. for two clean sheets, and having got the first one now. Everything's a bonus now, isn't it? Well, you almost fancy there could be another one Thursday night. That game might end up being a weird one where it ends up being quite fun, maybe. Particularly if, say, United went ahead earlier in the game. It might relax and let Chelsea into it, similar to what City did yesterday. Um, but for those who are on double clean sheet, yeah, there might be more to come here. You're on it as well, aren't you? you I am, yeah. Lindelof and Shaw, sure, yeah. Yeah, Shaw sure is great for the bonus in this. He, he, he hits the metrics across... BPS system quite well in terms of his uh, his pass completion. He rarely goes long and stuff. It's always quite short and he keeps the ball. It's his pass completions rate. He can beat a man. So his take-ons is normally quite good. Um, he's a good tackler. He, he kind of fits the metric of what a player who should do well on bonus is, basically. So it doesn't surprise me that he regularly gets in it. The other United players aren't defensive ones, aren't don't do enough to compete no, with him. No. So when they do keep clean sheets, he's unless head and shoulders. Dave Saves is going mad, he's liable to be the, the one. He's on a few set pieces and stuff, so you've got chances created on top of that as well. I think he was still taking corners at the weekend, I want to say. So, But those who punted on United otherwise, other than defensive, are obviously pretty, I guess, disappointed. There'll be a number of people listening to Captain Bruno. I'm probably regretting it. It's worth saying. Mate, he, very nearly, game to go, mate. he very nearly scored at the weekend. And as Suj correctly points out, it's one game to go. And at least you know that he'll play. Mm. Those of us sitting with Haaland, we, I assume he starts Wednesday. We don't even know, do we, really? I wouldn't be shocked if he was a sub again, for example. So the idea that uh, Haaland captainers have the advantage now, I wouldn't necessarily subscribe to that, actually. I think it's probably more if you went for your Antonis, your Sanchos or your Martials, you'd probably go, no. Oh, I wasn't keen on any of them. Nah, Bournemouth totally is honest. now an avoid for the rest of the season because I think they'll lose at Everton away on the last day of the season. Everton need to win. And uh, I think that I, t- I think Everton will win at the weekend. So I'm, I'm skipping Bournemouth now. No look, no look in there. I wouldn't bank on Everton winning at the weekend. Uh, Everton Bournemouth is subject to one of two clash of correspondence this week. Um, Sean and, and Neil previewing that Everton Bournemouth game tomorrow. I've already recorded it with the lads last night. Um, and Neil uh, discusses something quite interesting, the idea that, that Bournemouth are in, he didn't want to say they're on the beach. Um, but he, party, party mode. <laughs> he said, no, not even that. He said they're in experimental mode. Okay. Um, which if you look at some of the things they've done recently, like playing Mepham at right back at Crystal Palace, and bringing a few different players personnel-wise in at the weekend, you can see that. Like, you know, wonderful story to see David Brooks start this yeah, weekend, yeah. for example. But they've changed a few about. It was the first time I think Z- Zanessi and Zabani had played together at centre-back. Jay Nansen, he got a start left wing. And I think there would be a keenness to punt the Bournemouth left winger because Patterson might be out for Everton, right? And if it's the likes of Michael Keane playing out, you think, can we expose that? But I asked Neil specifically about left wing and it's like, 
don't know who's going to play there. Could be Otara, could be Anthony again. They might put Christie in. They might go to a back three and play Vina left wing back. So it's not clear enough, unfortunately, I think, to take a punt on Bournemouth player. It's probably more a case of Alvarez owners might land into a position where if they don't think he's going to start late on Sunday and you haven't got money in the bank, you think, oh, I need to go somewhere else. Someone like Solanke at the last minute, I think, does come into your thinking. Whereas value-wise, it will work. The fixture's still reasonable. Otherwise, it's probably a, a no-go zone, I think. Fulham 2, Palace 2. So the scoreline was equal, James. What do you think the possession was in the game? I have no idea, actually. 50-50. Uh, oh, okay. What do you think the shots for both teams was? Uh, seven on target each. 11 shots each. <laughs> How many big chances? Three each. Okay. How many big chances missed? Are you suge- one each. Are you suggesting this was a fair score? XG, 1.67 versus 1.55. Um, oh, well, that's not cl- the same, is it? Well, it's pretty fucking close. <laughs> uh, shots on target was five to four, James. So one shot in it. Um, but yeah, the stats, accurate passes, 291, 265. It just feels like total passes, 371, 352. It feels right. like this was a very even game. We got it. It was a fair result. I don't know, was it? I didn't see the highlights. So, I only saw the highlights enough. But if, um, if I was judging it on the stats, I'd be like, this is, this is pretty much I've a I've literally fair only result. seen what was shown on Match of the Day. Um, and it looked like maybe Fulham might have had slightly the better of it. Mitrovic but. back in, scoring goals. Talking about cheeky punts for the final day. I don't know if you fancy that. They're, are they um, I guess it's probably subject at Man to... United. If you had the uh, inclination to think Manchester United were going to mass rotate, then, yeah, you look at it on paper and go, do you want to buy Mitrovic away to Manchester United as your last transfer of the season? The answer's no, not really. But they conceded five home goals in the last, I want to say, 17 home games or so. Or, yeah. No, it's a bit more than that, 15 or so. So was it only eight conceded all season? It certainly, yeah. So, yeah, I think that's right. Five in their last 16 yeah. at home. Mitrovic up against Lindelof. But then if Mitrovic, is, if no, Harry Maguire's in the yeah, team, well, this he's is the going point. to fucking bully If it's Mitrovic against Maguire and they want to do something weird at the back, then yeah, yeah sure, by by all means, you can punt it. He's, he's clearly on the pens, which was a, a little bit of a, a question mark. It was only 50% ratio, wasn't it? I liked his interview where he said, I've had two months to practice it, haven't I? You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> I couldn't afford to miss it. Um, so look, he's a big difference difference maker for Fulham that's for sure yes you could punt him last I can't see that being on agenda for I me. fancy uh, Palace at home to Forest more because Forest obviously yeah. now is safe um, and, and it'll be a home game to end the season in fairly good spirits for Palace so I'd rather punt an Eze um, or an Elise than uh, than Fulham or Mitrovic. the forward one we've mentioned about cheap forward Solanke Odson Edward might just fall into line for the weekend mm. it's, it's if you thought he was going to start, and there's no reason to think, excuse me, that Odson Edward wouldn't start again, having scored at the weekend, he's probably not going to play through the middle. He probably plays the left side of forward. Um, but we we've, we've seen that that's not necessarily relevant because IU will probably play through the centre, and he he draws out where other people can pick up the space and stuff as per that goal at the weekend. So don't mind Edward. He's the sort of one I think is on radar for punt at the weekend. I feel like Elise is not bad either. So like everybody will. I'll say everybody will go for Eze. It's obviously going to be Recency a different number. Is Eze. There is that. But I, I think Alise has the whole potential in him as well, he where he's, he's close. So um, I'd, either of them, Eze and Alise in midfield or Eze up front, perfectly reasonable punts. As two, by the way, the two centre-backs. So I know I'd say don't go for a boring one, but because of Forrest's scoring record away from home, the likes of an Anderson or a Gahey have that 15-point feel about them, maybe. Yerry Mina of Everton's another one. You mm. think, could he... No, it's quite dull, isn't it? Uh, it's only yeah. really if you've got defensive issues, issues or problems, I think. But, yeah, I suppose... Or a Palace if, fan or if something. If you needed cover this week, and I want to get someone with a clean sheet who's got that potential, Anderson or Gahey well would have to be right near the well top, surely. Yeah, you could you could see Palace having fun and winning that game comfortably with a clean sheet, particularly if Forrest are on a piss all week, which they might be. They probably will be. And I wouldn't blame them if they are, to be honest. Yep. Um, so, yeah, Palace, Palace has its interest in for that final day. Fulham, less so. The team's quite settled at the moment. It's worth saying Fulham have had a very good um, season. And we should probably apologise a bit because we joked about them being on the 
on the beach. But actually, their form no, recently has been right. has been pretty good as well. And Palace have done amazing to get out of this. There is some speculation over the weekend, so just that Roy might stay on. Yeah, yeah, I've seen they want to they want to have conversations with him. So I think it'd be a mistake. Yes, but also you'd rather Roy than um, than and some anyone else could be a mistake as well, though. No, I get that. We've they know it's about not this, long this, term. This, this they know I, it's not long term. This idea of him. But he didn't want to retire. Being there. No, I get that. But to be honest, you know that if he stays on, it probably is Maxi. Yeah. There's a reason. There's a reason why you got rid of Cutley years ago. And let's be honest, these fixtures have been great for Palace, and they've done well. He's given freedom, right? The likes of Eze, Elise. But I just think there's there's a a, a situation for Palace again, where it's like, what do you want to be? And there's a chance with these young boys to progress and enhance and, and give them something different and take it forward over a longer term project where you get them involved. If you don't if you don't make the appointment this summer or something new, you're gonna do it next year anyway, surely, right? Yep. Now if Roy stays on, the Palace avoid relegation. Yeah, I'm sure, absolutely sure they do. But the Palace want to try and kick on and try and hit this top ten, which clubs like Brighton have shown it can be done. Palace aren't a million miles off it if they invest in the team in the right way. Uh, Liverpool won, Aston Villa won, two teams that probably are a bit on radar for the last week. I mean, Liverpool definitely away at Southampton because they're going to need to... If United lose against Chelsea and Liverpool will sense it, that they might be able to go for it and, and, and catch them for top four. It's it's a long shot. Aston Villa, on the other hand, um, will want to stay clear of, of you guys to get into Europe. Brighton, they need an eight-goal swing against Villa to fall back behind Aston Villa. I think they like, still theoretically finish above them. I guess if they, they can, beat them they, yeah. eight nil or more. Right. Jeez. That's not going to happen. 16 goals between them in goal difference. No, so, huge, so Brighton are comfortable at Huge six. congratulations to Brighton fans on reaching Europa League. That's a, a brilliant achievement. Um, yeah, as, no. as it is for Villa to have got themselves in a position where they're now favourite, I presume they're favourites, um, to finish above Tottenham. I guess it's, it's probably still quite close because... The, the bookies will probably have Tottenham as favourites to win at Leeds. And, and by, then by Villa, more than have Villa, to, to beat Villa would have to beat Brighton as well, if that's the case. Um, and it could even be... What's the, what's the goal difference between Tottenham and Villa now? This shows how interesting It's even, it is. James. Is it even, like literally. Plus four, plus four. But you've scored a lot more goals, right. 66 so, to 49. So, so Yeah, but my point is, for us to finish level, Villa would have to lose and us to draw, right? So therefore, our goal difference would be better. Yes. Yes, by one. How is it that my team... So it's only twice this has happened, right? A team has scored over 60 and conceded over 60 in the season. Oh, really? And both times, it's my team. <laughs> this year and in 07, 08. Can somebody please tell me how Tottenham have scored over 60 goals, conceded over 60 goals, and yet I feel like I've been bored all fucking season? <laughs> Can somebody explain that to me? Uh, Liverpool will feel like they haven't had their best season at all, to be fair. No, and, and there is something to be said of the fact that this this real change with Trent coming inside um, started with obviously the Arsenal game and then won every game since then. It's worth noting, over this period, Liverpool played two good teams. Arsenal and Villa. I'm not having my team as one of them in there at the moment, right? They, played, they played two good teams, <laughs> with respect, Serge. They played two good teams and they're the, they're the two games they haven't won. And it's a consciousness that. So uh, there's a lot of me thinking, with Liverpool, I feel like they are more capable than, say, a Manchester United right now of going, win seven, eight games in a row at the start of next season. And a little bit like what Arsenal did, and you go, shit, Liverpool are back in it again. Like, there's a chance of that. But I think for that to happen, Liverpool probably need a very kind opening fixture list. I think to be back in a title race next year. Uh, yeah, let's wait and see what they do in the market as well because they could fix their midfield problems. And yeah, but I don't think they're going to do massive. Trent fixes a lot of those midfield problems. Yeah, yeah. It should be said from the weekend, um, Aston Villa, and I didn't watch a lot of the game, um, but I was following it online while it was happening and while I was travelling to go and pick my son up. That's a patron story. Um, it is. And Villa were playing brilliant. Everybody was saying Villa should be a couple up. Obviously, Ollie Watkins missed the penalty and stuff. They changed a few things about themselves, Villa, with uh, Matty Cash and Luca Dean coming into the team. Um, they also, I, I want to say, rotated rather than dropped um, the excellent Emmy Buendia. They played McGinn in a bit more of an advanced role. That, I think that was more to get Bubakar Kamara into the team, who's much more of a sitting anchor player for Villa. And they gave Liverpool real problems and become very good at playing out from the back. I think Douglas Louise has had an absolutely outstanding 
three, four months or so. I think he's been one of the best midfielders in the league mm. since Christmas, actually. Um, and they've got to win one more game to get into Europe. And they want it far more than my team, though. There's no yeah. doubt about it. Um, I'd almost feel sorry for them at this stage if they didn't do it. But they're going to have to beat a, a very good Brighton final days. There's no guarantee. But that does, yeah, Villa players in terms of punts final day, sure. I think Jacob Rams is the one to punt. I think he's another one. I think it'd be very interesting FPL next year. He's another one. I see sort of staying around that five and a half ish yeah, value, yeah. and you can feel he looks more. Every time I see him, he looks more powerful. I think he's a really good player. I wouldn't be surprised actually if he's in the England squad. Okay, um, that's announced. I, I think it might be this week. I wouldn't be surprised if he's in it actually. Um, there's a few other Villa. Tyrone Ming should be in it as well. He's been very good for Villa very recently. Ali Watkins final day. You know Brighton will give you a chance. And Liverpool players are definitely on radar for Punt's final day with none higher than, presumably, Roberto Firmino. Does he start? Well, this is farewell goal at Anfield. I don't know. I think he started. I think, espe- I especially if top four's got, he starts, doesn't he? I don't know. Uh, they've got too much talent up there. I, 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 would, I would hate to have to put money on that, whether Firmino starts. So, couldn't tell you, James. I think he'll probably start. And I think that would be an interesting one. for, But people will want the news, won't they? And I, I agree with the sentimental aspect of what you said. It's like it's almost like he's had the good moment with with the equaliser yeah, in front of the cop. it felt like, you know, Kane um, scoring his last goal at Spurs, Rice scoring his last goal at West Ham, Firmino scoring his last goal at Liverpool. It was the one, wasn't it? The weekend of goodbyes. Yeah, the weekend okay, of goodbyes. Roberto Firmino, I think, is an, is an interesting one for a last day punt. I think Luis Diaz... Looks like he's got favouritism at the moment, left wing, and they're, they're trying to build up his fitness. I think that's a very interesting punt for final day. Mo, we're not calling punt, we're calling him maybe captain, are we? Yeah. I've not thought yeah, about it too yeah, much, but yeah. I think I'll probably captain Mo, I think, at the weekend. Uh, Wolves won, Everton won. Um, yeah, late comeback goal for Everton, obviously. But they had chances. Solanke was, was lively well, this, enough. They this, were pretty decent. This goal wouldn't have happened last week. You've not seen all the added time this weekend. Well, nine minutes, I know, but I don't know. Well, ours was, was seven minutes. Ours was, was just, nine. Yeah. I don't know where the fuck they got nine from. I don't know where they got seven I from. I have no idea. Well. I know, I know Brentford are, are one of the best at doing the time waste, but suddenly nine, nine minutes was yeah, like, what? Was Liverpool Villa was 10? Wow. Maybe they, they got excited from last Forest, Thursday. Where Forest Arsenal, I think, was seven. Time. Yeah, indeed. It but was a lot. Adama Traore. At the few runs where you're like, what a beastly guy he can be when he wants yeah, to Yeah, I mean, be. Sean Dyche, I, I found it quite refreshing. I know people didn't like it, but I found it quite refreshing that Sean Dyche said, we got to foul him there. Yeah. Because that's the truth. It's a white bullshit him, anyway. He's just powered through. And when he does that, he does that. Um, and obviously, uh, they ended up getting the goal from that. But a late, late equaliser for Villa keeps them... For Everton. Uh, for Everton, sorry. Keeps them just that <laughs> distance away where they'll feel like if they can get a result now, final day of the season, it's in their hands. Um, Yeah. I was discussed with Sean. I asked him straight out, how do you feel relying on Tottenham if it's going badly on Sunday? (laughs) 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 I'm not sure I love that, James. Yeah. Um, They completely understand that. It's in Everton's hands so long as Leicester don't win tonight. Yes. And I think, um, as you'll hear on COTC tomorrow, we, we discussed the idea that if we'd have offered this to Everton fans, the idea to have Bournemouth at home, a team with nothing to play for, who, listen, we've seen it before, teams get relaxed at this stage and they play good football good and they, they're not under duress or anything like that. They could, play, you know, could Bournemouth go to Everton and win at the weekend? Of course. The league tell, table tells us Bournemouth have been better than Everton. But for Everton to be in that position against the side that we've already said we know are experimenting, basically, ahead of next season, yeah, it's a great position for Everton to, to be in so long as Leicester don't win tonight so Lang- um, uh, uh, Calvert-Lewin as a punt I don't feel play oh okay so he went off injured just before half time um, hamstring I didn't know it was hamstring at the time um, I haven't spoke to Sean last night and seen the clip back yeah Sammy. he's done his ha- I, I, okay. probably a twinge but he indicates straight away to take me off yeah 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 um, and I, I don't I, I think ordinarily most players I mean he'll know his body really well because of what's happened to him the last few years um You'd think under that pressure, they were already losing at the time. If it was anything, he thought he could get himself through. He stays on the pitch, doesn't he? But it was like a minute to half time, or at least gets to half time. He doesn't. He's gone. I've got to come off. It's gone. So don't think Dominic Calvert-Lewin will play. 
the one that I think people want to punt, and I think that there's reason to have real interest in Everton this week, knowing that it's just the one week and you've not got to sort it out next week for the shit fixture. Dwight McNeil was the one. But Dwight McNeil is probably very relevant on whatever the fitness situation is with Vitaly Mikolenko. So Mikolenko didn't play at the weekend. Dwight McNeil essentially covered at left back. Now, if he's going to play left back... You don't want him. Okay, you say, oh, are we still on the corners? Great. That's not what you want from your punt last day. You're hoping he's going to get you a couple of attacking returns due to the Brighton away, for example. And do you know what? He's capable because you've got the... He's, he's good at shooting from long range. He's a decent crosser. He will be on man of set, many of the set pieces. So there are multiple routes to, to goal, potentially. But if he's playing at left back, you're restricting the open play possibilities massively. So Mikalenko's fitness is probably really important for Dwight McNeil. Um, Damari Gray will probably play, subject to, I think, Mikalenko's fitness as well. Um... There's every chance he'll play through the middle, but looking at his positional map from where he's come on at the weekend, Gray, it looks like he drifts left quite a lot, even still, even though he was Calvert-Lewin's replacement. I think the one that's potentially got the ceiling to do well at the weekend, and I know it's going to please Andy Martin no end, is Decoro. Um, he's the one who breaks into the box. I think he could be the one. It's a you know, cheapish price, be affordable for many. If you're sitting there with like your Brighton assets, you think, I want to get rid of that this weekend, or say one of them picks up an injury and you've got no money in the bank, I think someone like Decore would be right on radar yeah, for me. I, I get it. Um, but when we're talking, uh, I don't think I would enjoy it. You ain't going to watch it, are you? Nah. You'll just, be, you'll be watching West Ham at Leicester and I'll be at Ellen Road. So... I ain't watching it. Yeah, I'm, but I'm just about I haven't enjoyment got to from it. that point of view. Just from, it just, just doesn't. All you know. I'm going to do is walk out the ground at Ellen Road, get on the train, look at my points. <laughs> so it's not going to make a difference it. to me. I even got to watch it. Forest one, Arsenal nil. Um, so <laughs> the, the, I, obviously, I didn't watch this, and then um, after the result, I saw on Sofa Score, I was like, oh, okay. Let's see if this was a backs against the wall. Let's just defend with ten men and uh, and hold out for a one. No, one defended with there. eleven. Eleven men, <laughs> ten, 10 outfield players. You know, ten men behind the ball type thing. I saw the I saw the ball possession eighty two percent to Arsenal, but then then he had eleven shots throughout the game, and when I when I saw some of the uh, uh, pundits and commentary and talking about the game, it, it didn't feel like Arsenal were unlucky and they bossed it and they had loads of chances and created anything. They they were comfortable with possession, but um, lack of Lack of any kind of real it never threat. Felt, it never felt like Arsenal were going to score. Yeah, and so you're like, okay, well, it doesn't mean anything then at that point. And, and for like, having the ball for that long, and Forrest will come out of it thinking they're quite happy. And Taiwo, Awonye, Awonye. Taiwo. Taiwo. Uh, five in three games <laughs> yeah, has, has pulled him through. He's done well. Um, stories of teams surviving relegation who are probably unexpected to. Because I think... Most of us would have had Forrest to go down, go back a month or so. And I think, you know, even when we spoke to Mark Southerns before they went to Liverpool, there was real concern. Real concern that they'd missed opportunity games um, to pick up points. I didn't see the two but, big chances but, to us was none. The, wow. the, these, um, some of these teams who get out, there's, there's so many are littered with players towards the end of the season um, have done well and gone on good little goal scoring runs. And Awani is, is another one of them where it's come from nowhere. He's in nobody's FPL team. He's not going to be in your FPL team this week either. No. Nah. You're not punting that nah. away Palace. Nah. Are you punting nah. Palace? I'd punt player, an Arsenal you? player at home to Wolves. Did you buy Edward or Awani this week? Edward. We, exactly. That's my take as well, despite his yeah. form. I'd rather punt an Arsenal player. I mean, home at Wolves, they're going to want to do well in that game. Do you think the they wanted to do badly at the weekend? No, but I think they want to sign the season off in style at home and their home record has been decent Arsenal. So I'd rather, and Wolves are, are comfortable. They're not easy, uh, easy to play against Wolves, but I'm, I'm back in Arsenal in that. Arsenal so won one of their last three at home. Yeah, how I many they lost? I was against Chelsea, so it doesn't count. <laughs> one against Brighton. Yeah, so a win, a draw and a loss. Yeah, Great, right, is it? Yeah, I think they'll beat Wolves. <laughs> I think they'll beat Wolves. I think they probably. I'm will not going to punt an Arsenal player. We, we I should be clear, we, but we didn't talk about Wolves at all. And admittedly, no one's going to buy a Wolves player this week. Something now, just on Wolves. Just before I forget, something, something smells off from the weekend with certain players not wanted. There was rumours Moutinho didn't want to play. He didn't bring Net Jimenez on, even though they know he's leaving in the summer. 
something feels a little bit off. And do you know what? That might be Lopetegui trying to get people out of the club that he doesn't want there. Yeah? Something doesn't feel right. I think that's one really to keep an eye on in the, the summer. There's some sort of speculation there might be an FFP issue for Wolves as well. Um, but we don't think it is a big issue. But that's the story to keep an eye on. Sorry, mm. Arsenal. Yeah. Well, what about them? Uh, well, in, <laughs> I'm not punting in, on one. In the words of Frank Sinatra, because I think Arsenal fans should play this song to themselves. Uh, you ever heard the song That's Life? No. That's Life. No. That's what all the people say. Okay. Riding high in April, shut down in May. You don't know that one, though? No? Uh, that's the Arsenal That's the Arsenal song now. Okay. Sorry, guys. Um, it must be bad for a Spurs fan because you're trying to get joy out of yes, them and doing I, shit. And yeah, you do, I've like, got you no joy. Just win one game ourselves at least to put <laughs> us in a position where we can take the piss, you know? It's so bad. Uh, uh, but, but yeah, the joy they've done well. The though. joy in my life the last month has been Arsenal fucking it up. Because yeah. um, I, yes, listen, I'm a Tottenham fan. I've got nothing to shout about. And in serious, joke, take the jokes away. I think um, if Arsenal fans are properly, properly gutted at the market, you're fine to be gutted. But if you're upset with the team at the moment, I think you're over that. I think you've had a brilliant season, far beyond expectation. And the football you've played at times has been the best in the league for much of this season as well. I think in seriousness, you should be very proud of what the team's achieved. And it looks like you know they're going to push on again in the transfer market. We're hearing strong quality names being mentioned. Gundogan is the latest name I've heard reported this morning. There might be an interest. Is potentially going to be available on a free if he doesn't stay. Yeah, it makes season. sense. They are trying to turn into Man City light. So go go shopping at Man City again. Why not? Maybe don't. I mean, Gundogan wouldn't be a cast off. And as we discussed actually very recently, probably City probably regret letting Zinchenko go. Actually, yeah. Um, considering what happened with Cancelo, not to stop them. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Do you want to get Gundogan at 32? He's still a great player. But, but on a two-year contract, I'll take it. Mentality is good. Goal scoring, he provides cover. Yeah, I'll take it. And he's he's happy to rotate in and out because that's what he's had to do at City. He's not going to be moaning about being in the team all the time. I would, I would if it's a free transfer or uh, and um, not too crazy wages, I, I think I would. I think it'd be crazy wages. Um but yeah, I, I guess one of the things that will be levelled at Arsenal this year is did, they didn't have the experience to get over yeah, the line. Yeah. But they'll be better for the experience of being in for sure. the race and and understanding it. Should there be question marks over the fact that we've a much better team this year, certainly in terms of how it's performed, they have the last two years, though, finished the season badly. Are they being worked too hard earlier in the season? That was an accusation used to get thrown at Pochettino's Tottenham that I used to think was a really bad narrative, actually. Um and it might be a bad narrative around Arsenal, but I think should Arsenal get themselves in a similar position next year, the fans will shit themselves again. They'll be worried that can they see it through, and it just builds up that pressure, doesn't it? They, it's part of they had they had mentality. games which felt more like they were right at the end. Think of the Bournemouth win, and I'm not. This is not celebration police comment. It's just it's just more a fact that it was so intense for them, a game that shouldn't have been like that, right? Beating Bournemouth at home should have been probably straightforward for them. The circumstances with how they won, they have every right to go mad. But it 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 felt when you reflect on that, it almost felt definitive that game, didn't it? Yep. And now it's just a footnote. Mm. So there's a few people saying, well, "Did they get too emotionally involved and so?" I, I don't think we can ever. No, I just think it's probably a case that once they had the setback of the Liverpool game and then the West Ham game that they found the recovery quite difficult. We What we always say with City is once you're behind, it's like, oh my God, it's like a juggernaut coming for you. And they knew it was coming. And I, I don't think they could get over it. I think if he, if Arteta could go back to the City away game, I think he'd play it very differently if he had the opportunity again. And the reality is, what's the difference between the two teams, Serge? In points. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. don't have it open in front of me. I think, I think it's seven. And City okay. got a game in hand. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, it's a ten. Yeah, but then if Arsenal beat City twice, rather than lose to them twice. Mm, it's completely different. That, we always talk about six pointers at the bottom of the table. If City don't win them two games, don't win this league. Yeah. So, you know, how close was it really? Uh, let's move on to Sunday, James. European Conference League finalists, West Ham, who are massive. Three, Leeds one. That's how they will forever be referred to, James. Um, Congratulations what a, for those who haven't okay. heard it to the West Ham fans on Matt and Europa Conference League final. Well Indeed. done. Uh, two weeks and two days to go. Good luck. Good luck getting the ticket, by the way. 
<laughs> what a joke that is. That's a story for another day. I heard uh, rumours that uh, some of our players are going to face bans, James, because of uh, the punch-ups punch at on Thursday. That I, can't be if true. If that happens, that would be mental. But That can't be true. Uh, we shall see. Uh, five changes for serious. West Ham. Um, yeah, the team didn't surprise me. I spoke no, to you about but it. It, was, it didn't feel like particularly a weak team. Uh, four now is coming in for... Pick the team um, I expected, Barzuma. Yeah. And Zuma played half a game and Kera came in, but uh, changed at fullback and stuff. So five changes for West Ham. Um, I'm not sure in terms of uh, Leeds how many changes they had, but um, they looked lively in no, the first I 10 or 15 minutes. Leeds Bamford was, was decent and uh, Harrison was decent. And Bamford goes off injured just after we equalised. I didn't see the incident because I went for a, for a wee, James, and so I came back and all I could see was Bamford being taken off and, and Nonto coming on. Um, what did he do? Hamstring or something? No. Okay, fine. Whatever it was, he's injured. And then after I wasn't, that, can I be honest? With you? I, I went around. Mum and Dad's wasn't paying attention. Okay, <laughs> you said you had it on. I'm, that's why I was asking I'm, you. Yeah, but I knew you were there. I didn't think okay. you were going to the toilet. Uh, yeah. So, and we, but after he left, like we conceded a goal from a stupid long throw in. Good finish from Rodrigo. But other than that, the quality of Leeds' chances wasn't there. But they've come off the back of two one against Man City. And you think, okay, they've done all right in that game, even though they've obviously lost. What was the fixture they had before that? They did all right as well. Brighton? Who? Leeds. Newcastle. Newcastle. Again, um, they didn't have any fight, mate. They didn't. They, they didn't. In the second half... More importantly... They just didn't Can have... you think of any other goals you've seen that have been volleyed from a long throw? No. Ever? No. I can only think of one. Who's that? It was also scored against West Ham. Sergei Rebroff, FA Cup Court Final oh. 2001 at Upton Park. Oh. But I don't have a memory like you, James. Yeah, it was such a stupid long throw-in to concede because uh, the way that we gave away the throw-in was stupid. Sufal just kicked it against uh, Socek and it's a throw-in. Next thing you know, you're one down. After that, though, to be honest, West Ham completely controlled the game. They started quite well, Leeds, right? Yeah, they were all right. I wouldn't say they were like all over us, but they had a few few chances. It started with a team that had purpose. A little bit, yeah. But then when the equaliser come, that purpose seems to... It was like Disappear. a... It can be like that when you... You're down there. I think and my team suffered with that actually this year. Whereas it's like as soon as something goes wrong, it's like, it, like it, I don't want to say crumbles, but it's like it, it feels difficult to get your your motivation or your mentality right again. It was like as soon as Leeds hit their first problem in the game with that goal, like you had a quick breakaway quickly afterwards with yep. four nails and stuff, and it was like oh you can feel it coming. And it was only one result second half. Yeah, which was it, could, your team it should winning. have been five or six in the end if we were a bit better with our finishing. Um, and, and if we're talking about players to keep an eye on for next season for FPL, I think Paqueta, if he comes back in at six million, he might be one to, to have a think about because he's really it developed. It depends where he's going to play though, doesn't it? With the position he's playing in now. Um, which but is, if we presume that fine. Declan Rice probably isn't going to be there. There's an impact that we don't Yeah, know but yet. Ward Prowse will slip, sit nicely there. So Ward Prowse, yeah, that's what mate. you've decided. <laughs> okay. um, look, I don't, mind, uh, I don't mind if anyone wants to punt a West Ham player away at Leicester at the weekend. <laughs> By all means, punt a West Ham player away to Leicester. It's just, <laughs> Absolutely. It's, if they, especially if they don't get a result tonight at Leicester, um, and on the counter, we could do them some damage. Well, if Leicester, we could, if Leicester don't win do at damage. Newcastle tonight, they have to win. We, yeah, I don't know who though. This is the only thing. If we can get some uh, insight, if, like if a Ben Rama, Bowen, Paqueta, I think Ings might play again. I don't know, but uh, also yeah, where for go? Yeah, we talk about teams who well, Leicester's a perfect example of that. First half hour against Liverpool, they played all right last Monday. Mm. As soon as they conceded, it was like the walls came down. They were in, uh, very quickly could have been sort of three or four nil by half time. Um, and I, I just. This is the thing. We've had an experience this weekend where obviously City mass rotated off the back of Arsenal not winning at Night in the Forest, right? Because I, for me, there's no way... I read this completely wrong. I thought there's no way he'll change the team based on the Arsenal result. There's no way he was picking that team if Arsenal won Saturday night. That's also true. Right? So he did change it. I think it's fair to say. But it's interesting to try and think of narratives in your mind for scenarios at the weekend. I think if you're looking to take a punt in a game like Leicester versus West Ham and ask yourself... What's the situation at the King Power if Everton are two 0 up? If Leicester don't win tonight, and no, Leicester know that their only chance is winning. If Everton are say two 0 up against Bournemouth, and Leicester are drawing nil nil with West Ham, heads will drop. Feels that way, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. You can heads imagine will it. Drop. It will be like a, 
deflated. They yeah. feel like the, the sort crowd knows. Are, you can tell yeah. from the groans of the crowd and the nervousness of the crowd. Um, yeah, I, I haven't ruled out a punt on a West Ham player on on Sunday because we're talking about. Um, I've I've hardly owned any West Ham players all season, mate. If any, I wonder if I've owned a single player all season. So for the last game week, come on, boys, come up. I might pick one. I wouldn't. I wouldn't go near Leeds to be honest with you. As much as they've got to win against you, what Nonto, Somerville, I think, Harrison? No, Rodrigo's interesting. I think. Yeah. No. I, he I is think there's OOP. better options. He's, his goal ratio this year, considering he's not been fit all season, what's he on, like 13, 14 league right, goals? Yeah. He's good, Suj. Assuming Bamford's out, he'll play through in the middle up front, so he'll play OOP. We've already spoken about Tottenham have, what, the fifth or sixth worst defensive record in the league. Similarly, what, what's the situation for Tottenham if... I mean, I don't even know if Tottenham even want to finish seventh, but what's the situation if, if Tottenham are level with and Villa are three nil up against Brighton, for example? What's you know what's the situation for Tottenham in that mm-hmm. circumstance? So Leeds Tottenham, um, I think both these games Leeds Tottenham and Leicester West Ham, I, I think feel like they have the capacity to be a bit mad, as in three two one way or the other. They have that feeling about them. Well, what's the one fixture, if you look at the fixture this week, you think highest scoring game, even if you couldn't determine a result? I feel like it's probably one of them too. What, Leeds, Spurs, Leicester, West Ham? Yeah, one of them too, I think. Yeah. Southampton, Liverpool, I think Liverpool could do three or four. Um, or Palace, Forest after that. But that would be one way. Palace. Yeah, but then I don't Liverpool. see it. Like, th- there was one Palace. Two or three, beat. No, yeah. Yeah, you're right. I, I agree with you. I think it was Bournemouth, I want to say. I think, yeah, I might have that wrong, but Palace won a game 5-3 in the last day, one season. And there was a few people, including our mate Tom Cannon from Who Got the Assist, was talking up the possibility of that one being the one. Palace Forest doesn't feel like that because of Forest. Yeah, yeah. Could Forest go there relaxed and decide to go and have a party and it goes that way? Yeah, maybe, but I, I just don't really see Forest putting up a... A, a total that will make it like a mad 4-3 or something. I feel like the Leeds-Tottenham and the Leicester-West Ham games, it, one of them two, will be the mad one, I think. Right, let's uh, rattle through Brighton 3, Southampton 1. Well done to Brighton, as we said, to get into Europe. Jared Bowen, Suj. Yeah, worth a pump. Thank you. Worth a pump, definitely. Direct running in. He didn't have the best game, you know. Sometimes things don't quite work out, but he'll keep plugging away and he just needs that one chance. Who do you think will play up front at Leicester? <laughs> um... I think it could be Ben Rama, Paqueta, Bowen behind Antonio. Yeah, that that was what I was getting. I think Antonio I think will so. come back in, won't he? Yeah, I think he'll get a run out, but he'll get 60, 70 minutes. Um, I don't think he'll play the whole game. Um, I think with West Ham as well, it's worth remembering the Europa Conference League final is not till 10 days after the Leicester game. Correct. So it will be a strong team at Leicester. I can't, can't foresee that you're going to go two and a half weeks without uh, playing you know, your it, Declan yeah. Rices and stuff. They're yeah, all going to yeah. play at Leicester. No, they're going to play. Uh, Brighton, we've a lot of us have got three of them uh, because of all these doubles going into the last week. Southampton, uh, done, dead. And, and home time against Liverpool, who are going to want to win. I can't see anything happening there at, uh, at St Mary's and avoiding them like the plague, mate. <laughs> as, if you're, as if you're using your last transfer in the Southampton. Could you player. imagine? Um, there might be some Theo Walcott fans we'll, we'll, in the list. We'll, have a, we'll have a look at it in the next couple of weeks, but I'm I'm going to guess I'm probably not in the Southampton play yeah. this season. And Brighton, Brighton with McAllister Mitomas may be where the sacrifice can be made for a punty player, you know, if you decide more McAllister than Possibly, Mitoma. but then... Again, if Villa need to chase hard and early against Brighton, say they go 1-0 down and perhaps Tottenham are winning as well. Could that could that be a mad one, Villa Brian? I mean, to be honest, any Brighton game has the potential to it's be mad. mad. <laughs> yeah. mm. um, so factor that in. Yeah, Southampton, no interest. But do you know what? A little bit unfortunate yesterday in the sense that um, they scored, um, and I'll come back onto that goal in a second, scored by Alianusi. Then obviously very marginal offside call against Walcott, which, which would have made it 2-2, and it's really close. Um, and those who listen to us regularly will know I have a bit of a love in for Brighton's manager Roberto De Zerbi. but there are some repetitive themes that are problematic and I think are a little bit off-putting about his teams and that's one of them the Walcott situation where a turnover happens and, and actually they commit too many bodies as per the Everton game and you can get at them we've always said it they give you a chance 
It will give any team a chance, which means, as well as they're capable of beating anyone, they're also capable of, of losing and getting it wrong. Look at Brighton. They lost at Forest, right? They lost to Everton. So, if you set up defence, you need to play very well defensively to beat Brighton. But if you can do that, you have an opportunity to hurt them back the other way. And let's give some Southampton some credit because they've nothing to play for, right? And at stages of this game, threaten to make a game of it happen. What's more interesting is the Elianusi goal because they've de- conceded the same goal in the last two games. And they've got a set-piece problem, Brighton. Um, that near-post corner, um, Undev own goal at Newcastle, and Elianusi's fleet, it's the same goal. In-swing corner from what would be Brighton's right-hand side, right foot in-swing corner, get a flick on at the near post, still isn't dominant. I said this before on the pod, Serge, that he's a goalkeeper. I don't feel like he's going to save anything. His distribution is very good. He was so much better with his feet than I thought he was when I saw him play at White Hart Lane. But I still don't feel like he's going to save anything. And he's also got, he's got no... I can't think the right term. Domination. At presence. Presence, exactly the word. Thank you. He's got no presence at set pieces or anything like that. And that's a problem. And Aston Villa do have those players. Mm. So when we talk about boring centre-back punts... Mings or... I wouldn't be surprised if Mings or Consta scored a weekend. But then similarly, do you look at Villa and think, clean sheet at home to Brighton? Like you probably don't. But it could make... I mean, look, we talk about wild punts. Douglas Louise already mentioned... Um, has been very good this season and never would talk about him a fantasy asset. Those in swinging corners, he'll be the taker. And he likes to take them like he's shooting. Yeah. There you go. There's your game with 38 punt. Douglas Louise to score straight from a corner. Um, Brighton assets, I'll, I know what you're saying, Serge, but I wouldn't be dying to get rid of them. It might be uh-huh. like a sacrifice one. Yeah, yeah it's a sacrifice. I'm, it's not a need to sell. No, it's not a need. I must say, I've not give game with 38 too much thought because I just think... If one of my starting players, I've got what, uh, nine players to go or so, mm. technically, if one of them gets injured... Soldier position for it's you. probably just going to push me in one certain direction, isn't it? so I've not thought about it too much. Um, you know, talk, I'm, I, the thing is, I could say, oh, yeah, Douglas Louise scores straight from... I'm not going to buy Douglas Louise. Like, if McAllister got injured, I thought, oh, I want someone at that value to buy. I'm going to buy Decore or so. I'm not going to buy yeah. Douglas Louise, to be honest. Um I, I think Ramsey would be the one to, to pump for Villa against Brighton. I don't think you'd be buying Brighton new. Presumably you've already got it. What have you done? Oh, Ferg, Evan Ferguson scored twice in a double. Nah. Now I'm going to go and buy him. We always discuss this sort of thing, don't we? So that's gone. But amazing achievement for him. Genuinely, I'm so pleased for him. I think it would have been quite sad had they not qualified for Europe at all. And also I found it quite refreshing that they really did celebrate it yesterday rather than they were kind of in contention for top four. Never close to it, because the game's in hand, it was always a possibility. And there was nothing kind of deflated or fat from the fact that that had gone. And that was arguably, the performance at Newcastle was probably, it was arguably worse than the performance against Everton, actually. It just never got going, which is to Newcastle's credit last week. But they really celebrated that yesterday, and they have every right to. It's the first time the football club's ever qualified for Europe, right? It's amazing. And I think most people would agree with me and say, I hope they do extremely well in that competition next year. Good luck to them. They thoroughly deserve it. And last but not least, Man City won Chelsea nil. I mean, it was... A, a, All d- about d- the Man City team. Like. Rotated. Like, <laughs> yes. Uh, who's going to play? We don't know. I don't even know for the final day now. I'm just going to kind of ride it out and whatever. Whatever now. The, the brilliance of having Horn and Alvarez was one of them's definitely playing. That, Correct. <laughs> that was the take, right? Yeah, and Alvarez, I think, is still a fair pump for the last day of the season if people wanted to go um, there. I don't even know how we would begin to guess what City are now going to do on Sunday because I think a lot of the theory was they'd go strong for the weekend games and the midweek one would be the, the rotation against Brighton. So you keep it. The regular team plays once a week right the way through to these two cup finals. And he's obviously decided Saturday night. So it. Let me just let him have a run out. Yeah, I think so. Let some, some players have a run so out. I just find that really interesting. That I mean, you, I suppose you can do all the preparation for a game, but then the preparation doesn't matter, right? Yeah. And I, I, I guess in hindsight as well, is there anything in the sense that prior to yesterday, Brighton possibly still had something to play for in terms of are they compete? If they'd have lost yesterday... Villa and Tottenham still putting pressure on them. And Brentford, by the way, can still quit this conference league place on the final day 
should Villa fail to beat Brighton and Tottenham fail to beat Leeds, if Brentford beat Manchester City, which they certainly could do if City put a team out like they did yesterday, Brentford could still finish in seventh and qualify for the Conference League. And that also would be an amazing story and fully deserved if they get it like it would be for Villa as well. Because the size of the club, we credit that even more. Um, I mean, to guess what City will do at the weekend. Can we have this discussion after Wednesday, Serge? Yeah. I'm not even, I'm not even certain show. that, like, say, take, like, a KDB or a Grealish. Like, do they even play Wednesday night? I'm not certain. So I won't be sitting there tonight thinking, I don't, uh, Isak's my first sub. I think you've got Callum Wilson. I'm like, return. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I'm not certain that Grealish yeah, will. yeah. I'd rather points on the bench than no points on the bench, just in case. I'd rather, yeah, I'd rather the, the, the six or seven points probably sit on the bench than the one point comes off it, for example. Um, so, yeah, whole, guess away. You know, getting players a few minutes and what have you. Because um, uh, we wrap the game, so we're going to go into just a couple of questions on Twitter. Um, and before we do, we'll just talk about this. You can give a wrap of what we've got coming this week. Because, like, say, for example, <laughs> say West Ham win the Europa Conference League. Should Lucas Fabianski... Get a winner's medal. He ain't, he, played, he ain't played a single minute in the competition. But has he been in the squad all season? In uh, the Conference League squad. Yeah. Yeah. But it's you get a fixed number. Of, you get a fixed number of medals, right? Twenty-five medals or whatever. But then some of the kids played in the last group stage game, like some of the 17, 18, 19 year old kids. Yeah, but you're already through. So. So would you give them a medal because they've played minutes versus Lucas Fabianski? We'd have to ask Lucas Fabianski, who won lots of trophies at Arsenal. Not. Um, if he wants to keep his medal or not. It's a weird one, isn't it? I think, like, in terms of, pro- are you referring this to Man City and medals and stuff? No, I mean, they're just getting players minutes so they like, get, what, get that they were part of a title winning team or whatever. Um, well, I think, like I think, in, the, I think in the Premier League now, I might have this wrong, but I think you get about 40 medals. You just get a fixed number and you choose who you give them to. Yeah, basically. I think so. And it's the same in the Conference League. But then That's what I'm saying. Oh, you right, get a fixed fine. number of medals and then you decide who you give them to. But surely if you've played minutes in the competition and then someone else hasn't, but their first team has I been mean, in the squad. Be fair, Fabianski cheeky, is it? absolutely going to be on the bench for the final, isn't he? Yeah. He's not going to not be in the squad. Nah, he's no, going to be part of the travelling squad. Yeah, so yeah, of course yeah. he deserves a medal. I think it's those questioning the likes of Calvin Phillips and stuff, who very nearly scored yesterday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, does he feel a part of it and stuff? Yeah, look, he's played enough minutes. Of course, I think he or, has or played Ortega's played twice and kept two clean sheets. So, you know. And he'll probably play a couple more games, Edison um, owners. Few, uh, just a couple of quick notes on the game yesterday. Um, one is on Phil Foden, and it's a it's a reference point maybe for next season, possibly particularly if Gundogan goes. He's beginning to play central more and more. I think we should keep an eye on this. Uh, I think this could be unbelievably good news for England if that continues. Um, the idea of an England box midfield of Trent coming inside to play with Declan Rice, which would be behind... Foden and Bellingham at the tip of the box is nice. Yeah. Um, quite exciting, actually. Saka uh, and I Kane up could, top. <laughs> yeah, with Rashford or Sterling on the left, like, and Shaw, Stones and Walker as the back three. Like, it sounds great. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds yeah. great. Yeah. <laughs> he probably won't do it, but it sounds nah, great. But they're, and um, they're all like, under the age of 25. But that Kane as, well, as well. Can we just say, Cole Walker, we, uh, we need a partner for John Stones. Right, but if Cole Walker plays as the right-sided centre-back and Trent's going to come from right-back into midfield and you've got Walker and Shaw either side of Stones, it's problem solved, isn't it? It's fine, yeah. Yeah. Be decent. With Trent and Rice in front of it, Bellingham and Foden in front of that, Saka, right, Kane up front, Grealish or Rashford on the left. Yeah, yeah, job done. Decent team. Winning the Euros, aren't we? Winning everything, mate. Football's coming Everything, home. everything. Um, yeah, I really interested in that. Cole Palmer um, is a... Another brilliant talent. He's, he's going to get more and more minutes next year, and you should be aware of that, people, as well, I think. Um, but, yeah, to be honest, I, I feel it's almost pointless predicting the, the City team uh, for Sunday till we get past Wednesday. Sure, can you punt their players at the weekend? Absolutely, you can. For those who've only got two, you might be waiting late on to try and see if you get City team notes. Of course, remember, everybody kicks off at the same time on Sunday. 4.30 kickoffs. Be a 3 p.m. deadline. On Chelsea, I mean, it just, it just wasn't... It was an awful watch as a football match just because it just wasn't really an event. City were quite enjoyable in the first third um, and then I just think they couldn't be bothered. And Chelsea got into the game a little bit more. I deserve credit for staying in it. And then, to be honest, had some chances. Raheem Sterling had some good moments in the game. 
he would have been the Chelsea one to punt in hindsight. Um, Keperonas is back in goal and you probably have got another fixture away to Manchester United. They've got Newcastle final day. If you were punting Chelsea, I presume you've already done it for this week. But I'd be if I was on any Chelsea now, other than like Kepa's fine, obviously. But if it was only outfield players, I'd be probably thinking, can, where can I move that to to punt something else? If I'd gone for, say, Sterling, for example. Cool. James, what have we got the rest of the week? What do the listeners have to look forward to? Uh, two COTCs. Uh, very relevant. And this was put in place back in March, by the way. Everton versus Bournemouth with uh, Sean Norton and Neil Grover tomorrow. Leeds, Tottenham, Thursday. Vandy Martin, Ricky Saunders. So it, FPL slasher focus on what's happening at the bottom of the table. Sky Fancy Wednesday. I'm going to Ellen Road Sunday. So no deadline stream on Sunday. Sorry, priorities. Because I like winning away from home, as such knows. So, because I've become <laughs> so accustomed to that it. That was a conversation. With my uh, three away wins from my 16 away trips this year. Yes, that's true. Um, so I'm going to do not a deadline stream Friday afternoon, which on will feature all the graphics that would normally be on the deadline stream. And I'll release that as an audio as well. Patreon pods this week, Q&A today. Money in football tomorrow on the situation with Ivan Tony. Uh, Wednesday will be Tottenham, which I want to call, is it over yet? Um, but for you, it's not. Uh, Thursday, uh, Dan Locke's doing a quiz, which I'm going to be answering the questions on. It's a quiz on Premier League final days. And we'll do our final differential show of the season surge on Friday. Game with 38 preview. Lovely jubbly. Sounds amazing. Um, I've been through the questions that we had in on Twitter. We get to this stage of the season. Have we We've answered most. All? Except one. Oh, okay. Go on. And we're going to end the show with that. Um, and it was Kartik Raja. He says, what food have you consumed the most of in your life? <laughs> Lamb dollar kebabs. Lamb dollar. No, no, it can't in, be. It's got a food in my life. It's got you can't chips. say like an ingredient. Chips. So you chips. can't say like milk. Chips. I bet. It's, I bet it's something like breakfast cereal for me. Chips. Or toast. I had a stage when I, when I was a kid where I just eat chips. Really? Like nothing else. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's too easy when you've got little ones to just give chips. them chips. Yeah. Chips. Uh, I think maybe rice. I'm trying to think. Or cereal. It's got to be breakfast cereal because most days when I was a kid, I would have breakfast cereal. But bread. Bread's got to be a good shout. Yeah. It? Toast. Um, but rice, I think, more than anything else. Rice, rice, baby. Um, that's a good question. What food would you like to have consumed most in your life? Lamb done a kebab. Chips. Oh, you're getting me hungry, James. I know there's another question there about Man City that's quite interesting. Is there? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, but we debated this before. Did we? Yeah. <coughs> I remember we had a conversation about this before where we looked at their bench and we were like, their bench would beat the majority of teams. Okay, so City, their bench would beat the majority <coughs> of teams. <coughs> City's bench yesterday cost over five hundred million pounds. Did it? Um, yeah. Okay. The nine of them, uh, ridiculous, wasn't it? Was it Edison, Stones, Diaz, Gundogan, Rodri, Holland, Grealish, Rodri, De Bruyne, and Bernardo Silva? <laughs> yeah. And the question was that I put out on Twitter yeah, yesterday yeah. was if that nine, just that nine, two players short, played. Every week, where would City finish in the league? Mid-table. Uh, to be honest with you, I think it'd go down. Eventually. But they'd, they'd, they'd win a few games. I just think, what, would they finish on Neil Poir? No, yeah, no, they would win a few games with nine players. Because those nine are so good. But I think eventually, you'd, you'd work it out, wouldn't you? You'd know how to set up yeah. against them, etc. You'd have to play, they'd have to play the defensive third and midfield as if they had 11 and just rely on But the thing is, if you, if you had to pick top. a City 9, the, the point was with it as well, arguably that would maybe that would be very close to the 9 you'd pick. Very close. Yeah, yeah, it's true. You could definitely play like Grealish and Bernardo as like wing-backs, I think, in this. Stones and Diaz as two centre-backs with Rodri in front of it. And then what else Gundo, you got? Gundo and De Bruyne, De Bruyne behind Haaland. And you can still create like your, your box within the system. Probably be more like a triangle because you're a man short. But Rodri's better than some teams with two players anyway, in fairness. How good was he against Real Madrid last week? My God. Too good. Um, but in all seriousness, yeah, if, if if you had a football a team even as good as City, if they had nine players every week, yeah, they'd probably get relegated. I don't think they finished bottom, though. Let me let me say that. Yeah. yeah. But I think, yeah, they'd, they'd go down. Yeah. Maybe that's the next thing for Pep to try. Listen, more importantly... How many points do you Maybe think... Maybe that's the next thing for Pep to try. Start playing with... How many points do you think City will get in League 2 in three years? Uh, debate for another day, James. 
on that bombshell, because I've heard the City fans are rather upset. No, uh, congratulations, yeah. enjoy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You might as well enjoy it before it gets taken from you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, listeners, uh, chill this week. Chill. Three more games to go. Plenty of players left to go. You know, just tune in, tune out, and uh, we'll be back at you on Friday for the patrons with the Diff Show and other content throughout the week. And, of course, as we get towards the weekend, so much easier with all the games at the same time. Um, yeah, I'm not even going to mention and talk about team leaks and the panic with that because I'm going to ignore it all. But stay safe. Look after yourselves. Ciao for now. No, actually, it's a quick, fair point. Will you be waiting late for transfer? Late-ish. I probably will as well. Late-ish, but, but I'm not going to be I, I'm not going to tend to hook. Ricky's not coming to lead, so I've got no one to remind me about the deadline this time. Oh, okay. It could be quite dangerous. I'll text you, don't worry. You'll text me, don't worry. No, I'll text you like, you know, like you do Sky Reminder for me. I'll do FPL Reminder it, for this you. This prick will message me at quarter past three and he'll be like, did you forget? <laughs> <laughs> Listeners, have a great week. Back at you tomorrow. Ciao for now. Thanks, everyone. Be nice to each other and play it your way. Cue music, please, man child. 